So welcome everybody. This is the second session um, that we've that Unexposed Collective um, have held with the women of Up Photographers. And um, the first in the first session, Rebecca and I spoke with Melissa O'Shaughnessy, um, Graciela Magnani, and um, Eleanor. And this, and tonight we're speaking with Alison McCauley, Meg Hewitt, and Julia Bayer. And we're really delighted to um, for them to come and, and speak with us. And we're really grateful for the time that they're giving us. So a big welcome to, to you all. So tonight we'll just, each person will do a presentation as, as we did in the first session. And, um, I think Meg has offered to go first, and then we'll have Alison and then Julia. And if you want to ask questions as about their presentations as we go through, just put them in the chat and um, we'll um, collect them and then ask them afterwards. And then follow, we'll follow that with a discussion about women in street photography, a little bit similar to what we did in the first session. Okay. So, Meg, you ready to go? Hey, so, ready to go. Share my, share my screen? Yes, please. Great. Okay, so thanks, Julia and Rebecca. It's an um, honor to be here with my fellow upsters, Alison and Julia. Um, so I'm just going to uh, give you a brief overview of um, various series that I've worked on so far. Um, it's a bit weird because I can see all of you on the right and then I, I can only see part of my screen. Is that correct? Yeah, it's yeah. really annoying when that happens. <laughs> so will people be able to see the full photo or should I make it smaller? Yeah, no, we can the, see the full one. The full one, great. Yeah. All right. So my most, um, well, the first series I worked on from 2015 to 2017 was Tokyo is Yours. Um, I was I was shooting probably from about 2011. I took up photography quite late in life. A um, bit of background, I was born in Sydney, Australia. Uh, I went to art school in the 1990s um, and studied painting. I didn't study photography. Uh, I ended up life kind of um, kicked on. I traveled quite a bit and I ended up back in Sydney running a restaurant, uh, which was my own restaurant. And um, towards 2010, uh, I was looking for something to do just to, to relieve a bit of the stress of, of running a very busy cafe, um, drinking way too much, smoking way too much, crazy lifestyle. Um, so I decided to hit the streets with a camera and just um, see where that took me and I fell in love with the the whole process uh, did some short courses at the ACP Australian Center for Photography which unfortunately is currently in hibernation um, and then come 2015 I'd got to a point where I really wanted to make a body of work that worked together so I was thinking about things that moved me things that I was interested in uh, and I decided to travel to Japan um, to make this work so I could really concentrate uh, and focus on everything around me in this country where I can't speak the language and, um, and this is what happened. <laughs> so Tokyo is yours. So the series is set in Japan post earthquake tsunami 2011. Um, that was really in my mind when I was making this work. This uh, is an escape ladder near the coast um, in Chiba province. So I was imagining all these people sort of scuttling up this escape ladder to try and get out of danger's way uh, and what that would feel like. 
This is a guy I met in Japan uh, who lives in a cardboard box under the Tokyo Metropolitan Building with about 20 cats. He was showing me all his cats. This is the cover of my book from that series, uh, Yuka. And Yuka was describing to me what it felt like uh, in 2011 when she heard what had happened. Uh, that was the expression that she made. Tokyo has all these amazing small bars and a completely different sense of space from what we're used to. So this is somebody entering into their small bar, Mama-san. I think Julia and Rebecca walked past this bar with me actually in um, Tokyo when we were there together. Uh, another bar in Tokyo, Sana, Sana Dushira, I think it's called. The body parts. The wrestling wave. This woman, I think, was a madam who had finished work for the evening. Um, and often when I work, I engage with the people around me and it becomes a bit like a dance with them, sort of. They, they're aware that I'm photographing, I'm using a flash. Um, and it gets to the point where they feel comfortable and just photographing a lot um, and participating in what's happening. And, and this, is, this is kind of what happens. Uh, this is a result of that way of working. So it's not um, observed street photography per se, but it is made in the public and it is made um, without being set up. It's part of a... part of a... Well, like it, I like it like a dance, yeah, with the people around me. This is underwater at Katsura, which is about 150 kilometers south of the Fukushima power plant. A uh, woman's out in the ocean cleaning the, cleaning the outside of the tank, and it all looked pretty normal underwater. This is kind of my ode to Daido Moriyama. I love his um, series of, of stockings, fishnet stockings. Um, my friend Cowrie was wearing fishnet stockings in a bar uh, one night and we made all these pictures. We made about a hundred pictures under the table with her legs. <laughs> uh, this I think follows in the book because it mirrors the pattern on his shirt with the legs. Uh, he's linked to Marilyn. This was taken in the zoo at Kyoto. Um, kind of reminded me of the hand of David reaching out the Sistine Chapel, but to a goat. I like its abstract quality. This is more kind of street, observed street. It's um, a baseball, 24 hour baseball rink in um, Shinjuku looking through the, the gates. This is a pairing out of the book. So it's a tunnel from Katsura paired with a woman uh, from who I met in Kyoto. Uh, she was very hot and was carrying her kimono like a baby, but there's actually no baby inside. And this is my friend Yoko in spring uh, around the anniversary of the earthquake. She is reminded of her mother who died around that time uh, and she was expressing to me what that meant to her. So then after I made this book, uh, I launched it in Al in 2017, a long signer exhibition. And um, I had an opportunity to travel to the New York uh, art book fair uh, with Trolley Books, which is an English company. Um, so a friend of mine there, Hannah, she uh, couldn't make the stall and I said to her, oh my God, it's my dream to go to New York, to the New York Art Book Fair. So she rang me up and said, hey, how about you go look after the stall? Um, and so while I was there, I was just wandering around, you know, jet lag, four in the morning, making pictures in the street. Um, and it had been about 10 years since I'd been to the States. So, uh, 
fantastic um, sculptural headpiece. This was in Little Italy. I couldn't believe these things existed. They're butt pads. So you, you buy them at Walmart and put your mini pads to give you a big butt. Uh, and I was following them down the street for about 10 minutes. Just totally obsessed with these butt pads. <laughs> <laughs> Sausages at a fair, outdoor fair. I actually made lots of pictures throughout the Hazard um, area near, well, it's in Brooklyn, um, Williamsburg, and I've been meaning to edit together a selection of them, but at the moment this is the only one in the in the series. Uh, with a, I think it's called a Stremel, the hat, made out of beaver fur. And across the road from where I was staying, Hillary Clinton was giving a talk, and I just found it amazing that this guy angry guy from InfoWars, which is one of those um, conspiracy theory websites, um, saying that the Clintons hate America, whites, blacks, Danny Williams, and free speech. And this guy just straightened his face, making a photo. So then um, I was posting pictures from, from New York on social media, and a lady in um, New Orleans uh, saw them. And she's got an artist residency there called the Tiger Mendon. And she invited me down to New Orleans uh, the following year to do a residency there. So I was privileged to spend a month in New Orleans. Uh, and that was the start, well, the continuation of my interest in America. This was the start, that was the continuation. So New Orleans was 2018. There's that famous book, um, The Corner of Desire. Yeah. <laughs> I met this man on Decatur Street. He was just so deep south to me. This was a bar and it was like a, a bar on um, Bourbon Street, famous Bourbon Street. And it felt like a stage show or something. I walked past and everyone was just in the right place at the right time. I think I only made this one frame and just knew that everyone was in the right place and moved on. <laughs> it was one of those special moments. This guy's a poet who was, um, I don't know what he was trying to explain to me. He was trying to explain to me how to get somewhere. Okay. Anyway, it was over there. Uh, this is the backyard where I was staying. I just like the way it's kind of become abstract with a large field of white and the shapes. She reminds me, is it Elizabeth Burton? No, she's very dramatic. So this is one of my favorite photos from there, the no photos photo. Uh, and I asked her if I could make a photo and she was, yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> that, that. <laughs> that was um, at the country club, the New Orleans country club, it's called. Pick up truck. Freddy's lunch stop. This is my favorite lunch stop. Um, and I love the way the guy sleeping outside, his shirt is like the wall. He came part of the, the whole scene. This guy was interesting. He um, was trying to save up money to get his head brace removed. I mean, America, living in America kind of scares me with them. Um, I'm not, a, I'm not, I'm not from there, so I can't comment too much, but you know, the, we all know about problems with health and um, inequality. Uh, there's a lot of people struggling. It's like a it's like a war zone. Uh, there's a lot of returned soldiers begging for money. There's a lot of crime. There's a lot of guns. Local skank. This was the, this was a restaurant in and out kind of situation, I think, yes and no. 
But um, there's been questions asked about whether it's a racial comment as well, because obviously in the South um, there was segregation, but I'm pretty sure this is just in and out, yes or no. But it could reference that for sure. This guy moved to New Orleans to help out with the cleanup after Katrina and ended up staying. <clears throat> That's the classic, that's two doors down from where I was staying. It's a classic sort of New Orleans house. So then I went back in 2019 thinking, well, I've started now. I've got to continue with this America thing. Um, and so I decided to go to California and Nevada. Uh, and I got the Greyhound bus. I can't, I can't drive on the other side of the road, it terrifies me. So I decided I'd get a, a Greyhound bus pass and just travel by bus. Uh, but that ended up terrifying me maybe even more. So I don't know if you guys have ever been on the Greyhound in the States, but it's a real, <laughs> it's a real experience. There was a guy, the guy sitting next to me was traveling with his television. He'd been on the bus for four days. He's going to see his son. There's people smoking ice in the back. The guy was yelling at everyone. Everyone was sleeping with the blanket over their head with the seatbelt around it so no one could pickpocket them. Um, yeah, it was just crazy. So this was the bus stop at Barstow, the dog and the dog. And the bus stops. Yeah, this is at Barstow. So Lots of shops just looking pretty decrepit. Perfect donuts. Uber Eats. I traveled especially to see these oil fields. Um, and they were amazing. It was just as far as the eye could see, these little machines going up and down like little animals in the landscape. Uh, and the air was thick with pollution. And yet just in the distance was the fruit bowl of, of California where they grow all the fruit. Uh, it was quite an eye opener. So this is classic of 80% of the motels that I saw. They're sort of run down, filled with junkies and um, people who have hit rock bottom. Uh, Sometimes I was booking hotels on a goder and I'd get to the front and there'd be a guy out the front with a knife and I'd just keep going, you know. Um, even reputable ho hotel brands, you got there and the windows were broken. So this was a classic scene of a hotel. So my next trip, I want to really focus on this trip. I was just struck by so much poverty yet again. and. And on my next trip, I want to balance it out by just seeing the other side of, of um, the States and seeing how the super wealthy live. Um, so I can supplement this series with all the different aspects of life. So I don't think I felt overly safe at this moment. Uh, this was in Vegas, uh, going to the wrong end of town. I only found out after I had been there that it was the wrong end. <laughs> but it was the most interesting end, that's for sure. Um, guy in a bar. So this is uh, Fremont Street where all these kind of performers gather and, and people get hideously drunk. And I just like this moment because it says up and down in the background and the guy is going down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is um, Bellagio, the, what do they call it? It's the um, conservatory of the Bellagio, which they deck out with all these amazing kind of installations of animals and crazy over the top things. goth couple at my favorite bar in Vegas. <laughs> this is in the wedding chapel strip. Um, 
I just saw these people in the distance and I crashed their wedding. So <laughs> I ran in and I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. May, may I make a photo of you? And they're like, yeah, sure. Um, and they just posed so perfectly. And his bow tie is a little bit wonky and she had so much um, fake tan on that she was bright orange, which you can't tell on this photo. But uh, I said to them, so first time marriage? They're like, ah, you know, laughed. And <laughs> anyway, they um, sped off in the convertible for their honeymoon afterwards. True Vegas wedding. The strip. Strippers on the strip. Uh, and the, what is that tower called, the hemisphere, no, something, stratos stratosphere, the stratosphere, so the bit behind the stratosphere is like the roughest part of town. So this was on my way out through um, San Francisco. I met Crystal in a bar, in a dive bar. I actually ran into the dive bar because outside the dive bar was totally freaking me out like I've never been so scared in my life um, and then this ended up being my fa favorite place to go it was like three doors down from where I was staying and I'd sometimes go out and go oh my god I just go in the dive bar and have a couple of drinks and then I'll be okay then I'll be able to walk down the street without feeling like I'm gonna die he was a returned serviceman showing a bit of muscle Used to live in the area, priced out, originally from Mexico. And then this is when I braved up and faced the street. So this guy was a drug dealer and he let me take his picture but with a mask. And he was zooming around on his um on his scooter and you know there's one this was the corner for Oxycontin and um ice, I think each corner had a different drug. And there was a woman actually on the ground behind him who was living in the gutter. There's kind of people everywhere. It's a pretty crazy part of San Francisco. And ending on a lighter note. <laughs> Just a um a mannequin in a window. I quite like the um the abstract lights, etc. So then, uh, recently, around the same time as I joined up, I also joined an Australian collective called Oculi, and for that I uh, put together a bunch of work that I've been making over the years in Australia. Uh, so this I'm kind of calling the Emerald City Working Title. Um, David Williamson, I think, has a book and referred to the city as the Emerald City. Um, it's a very debauched place, Sydney. So. The nightlife is to watch, there's a conservatism, but there's also a crazy sort of underbelly of it, which is the place I like to be. Um, so this is one of my favorite bars, the Bearded Tit um, in Redfern. Michelangelo is the guy on the right. Can't remember where that was. The Green Park Hotel. So for those that don't know, Opal cards are like um, a transport card. So this guy had an Opal card earring, so he wouldn't lose his Opal card. I love his um, <laughs> his uh, tea, tea cozy kind of hat. Yeah. And in going through the archive, I was just pulling out anything that had direct Australian references, and this obviously Bondi and Chico rolls. Um, if you haven't had a Chico roll, it's a sort of deep fried pastry with a slightly spicy, glutinous carrot, cabbage, unidentified meat sauce inside that was famous when we were young. <laughs> I think this was around Mardi Gras. Sorry about that one. <laughs> it's a bit confronting, the, the viewpoint. Again, direct Sydney reference, the sparkly Harbour Bridge with the disco pants.
And this one reminded me of the expression bridge and tunnel. So when you live in the inner city, it's like people from outside the inner city come in to go out by bridge or tunnel. You know, I think they have, they have the same expression in New York. And this guy, he, he's a, a local around sort of Paddington, Darlinghurst and fantastic guy. He actually goes around pulling out, recycling out of the rubbish bins and putting it into the recycling bins. He's a real um, champion for the environment. Uh, and this night he was, he was lying by the uh, green park waiting for the local food truck to come and, um, and hand out the weekly sort of supplies. But he's a real kooky character. The sailor, I call him. And I think this was Mardi Gras as well. Okay, so that's it for my presentation of work. Um, if you want to check out more, you can go to my website, makehewitt.com, or follow me on Instagram, makehewitt underscore at the end. Excellent. <laughs> so, Thanks, Nick. Thanks for the opportunity, guys. I'll stop sharing. Okay, thanks. And um, we don't have any questions just yet, but I have a question. Um, so with your, I, I've just noticed with your Japanese work and New Orleans and the Emerald City work that it's a little bit more intimate than say the, the project from California and Nevada. Is that because you had sort of more difficulty accessing people when you were there. I sort of get the sense that it was yeah. a lot harder. Yeah. yeah, it was definitely harder. Um, I did make some friends in Vegas towards the end and yeah. kind of wish that I'd had more time there with them at the end. Um, so sometimes, you know, like with Japan work, these relationships built over many years going back yeah. and forth from Australia to Japan and Sydney, obviously I live here. so. The people are close to me yeah uh, whereas america like i actually fear for my life a lot of the time yeah um and i think i think next time um like i'm not exaggerating i think you know sometimes uh i couldn't actually man up and get out of the hotel room i felt like i had checked into the wrong place i didn't have a car yeah and i attempted to walk down the street and just did not feel safe yeah so Especially like Leica had lent me a camera and I didn't, you know, want um, to be a target. <laughs> <wanna> uh, <laughs> and, um, and so I would get an Uber to get out of that area to go to another area. But it was in my mind that there was, that I was, I was not sure what was a good street and what was a bad street. Yeah. Uh, so I think if I had the opportunity next time to get a fixer, to yeah. walk around with me or to take a mate to drive the car, I would definitely feel safer. Yeah. Uh, and then I would be able to approach people more. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I do have other work from New Orleans where people, yeah, New Orleans, you said like people are, are kind of more close. It, yeah, it's, it's a slightly them. more intimate kind of atmosphere there anyway. Yeah. Like, yeah. Less threatening. And, yeah. and one other question I have is, um, did you did you ever find out if the lantern trash man um, got his pet thing off money, money <laughs> to get rid of his brace? Well, I actually I asked a friend of mine, Matthew, who lives there. Um, yeah. he, he he doesn't live there anymore, but by the time he left, he still had it on. Okay. So he, he still had it on like six months later, yeah. a year later. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, does anyone else have any questions for Meg or should we move on to um if you do just type them in and we can ask them later anyway yeah okay yeah. great thank you Meg no problem. okay Alison you're up you're up next okay well thank you very much for having me it's a pleasure to be here um so I'm going to dive straight in um okay. into screen sharing straight into the pictures. Okay, excellent. There we go. Okay. 
Okay, um, so this is looking very wrong. Uh, I need to make it smaller, right? Um, if you press the green, um, the green button up the top um, left hand side, you might be able to expand the size of the screen. Okay, I can do full screen like yeah, uh, yeah just try that and see if it works. Yeah, okay, how's that? Uh, no different, but it'll be fine. Just go with that. Okay. If you if you do Command Shift and the letter F, it should go full screen. Yeah, that's what that's what I just did. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'll make it. Shall I make it a bit smaller? Can you just or maybe press, just go, just press F. Command L. Command L. Command L. Yeah, that'll turn the lights up. Oh. <laughs> or if you just okay. press L, just press L. Yeah, L. That's it. L. Okay. Is that better? Uh, no, yeah. We have a white screen now. Okay. Try L. <laughs> one more. Press keep keep pressing L. No. Press the arrow key. No. Yeah. <laughs> um. So right now I have it large, but uh, with you you guys down the on the right, is that okay? Um, All we can yeah, see is we can't box. see anything. Oh no. Okay. Sorry. Well, that's okay. Um, so we've lost the image. So maybe, okay, just, maybe just um, close. And how is that? Is that better? Uh, well, we still can't see the image. So okay. we're just getting a white screen. What can you, can you see the image? Um, I can see the image. It says you are screen sharing. Okay. Uh, maybe just close the screen share and try again. Okay. Close the light room window too. Yeah. Mm. Close off light room. Uh, you might need to okay. um, quit out of it and restart and um, okay. open so it. I might as well start uh, talking a bit about myself. <laughs> so uh, like Meg, um, sorry. Uh, so like Meg, I was also a painter. Um, I studied at university as a painter. Um, then I also later on in, in life, I also studied photography. Um, and I kind of, I've been through many different types of photography, but um, I've, I come now into this sort of very sort of personal, almost uh, genre-less photography. Um, okay, just one sec. Yikes. Now even I can't see anything. Oh, there we are. Just try screen sharing again. I think. Uh... Yay, it's worked. Uh, okay, wait. <laughs> Unfortunately, the first image is blank for some reason. That's okay. Okay. Um, so can you see the full image now? No, but let's not mess around with it. Okay, okay. <laughs> so I, it again. can you see some of the image? Or yes. Shall I describe yeah, it? You can see enough of the image. Okay. So I'm going to show you um, three different series. Um, and I, I, at the moment, I'm really kind of incredibly interested in making handmade books, which uh, I feel sort of match my images very well in a sort of slightly disheveled sort of kind of uh, organic feel to them, uh, much more so than a, you know, a beautifully bound, perfectly made, um, more commercial book. So um, I'll show three series that, and the end result of those series has been um, a small, small edition handmade book. So this, these are part of a series called Dancing with a Cobra, which was about um, a return to, to, to Southeast Asia where I lived as a small child. So what I did was I, um, basically I really just photographed and then selected the pictures that reminded me of my childhood. 
and uh, sort of put together this very sort of loose, um, non-linear kind of narrative. Um, so basically, it's really, um, you'd have to look for the story. It's more of a feeling than anything else. But it was a very interesting time that we lived in, in Malaysia when I was a child. It was the time that uh, Singapore uh, was rejected from the Malaysian Confederation. And there was a lot going on. And as a child, I was obviously wasn't aware of all of this, but um, I always find it very interesting that I was there during that time. And that time when Lee Kuan Yew the, cried because he was the country of Singapore had been rejected. It was, uh, I kind of think I remember that, but I know I was too young to remember it. So it was all a, a very, very strange, surreal thing to, to remember for a child. So while I was in Southeast Asia, I traveled around uh, and, and the image could just come from many different places. I mean, this one is actually from Indonesia, but it could very easily be from Malaysia as well. And the, the, the way I put in images together, um, it, it's never really about the single image. It's never about a single image. It's always about the fun of putting them together and of trying to create something, but to create something that is not really that obvious. It's sort of, it, it, it's meaningful, but it, it's open to interpretation. I mean, this one is from actually from India. But I think there's something about Asia that I really love. There's something sort of very textual about it. And um, where I live right now in Singapore, uh, in um, Switzerland, sorry, it's so, by comparison, so clean and cold and sort of, there's not, no kind of loose edges or anything. It's not, it doesn't really suit being fuzzy. And I, I, I do like fuzzy. And this is uh, the book that I made, uh, Dancing with a Cobra. I made um, 44 of these books. So this here says, I remember the time we, we were playing near the edge of the jungle and I came face to face with a cobra. That evening I told my mother that I had danced with a snake and I showed her the undulating moment, movement the cobra and I had made as we looked each other in the eye. And th that was a true story that happened to me when I was, I was uh, about four. So when I, I make these books, I like, um, you know, I, I source page, paper from all sorts of strange places and these, this, all this paper was from Asia. So I, I quite like that idea. And then I ran out. That's why <laughs> part of the reason why there were 44. Uh, this one actually was in, taken in Cameron Highlands, which is very close to where we used to live. And I, I take images from everywhere. I basically have a camera with me the whole time. So, you know, I'm not, it's not really, some of it's street photography, a lot of it is, but a lot of it's, this is, for example, a photograph of my daughter. So really it can be anything, which is a great thing. It's very liberating. I don't feel I have to be in a particular situation to, to get a picture that might suit my purposes or might feel right. Uh, this is the text, I won't read it all, it's a bit long. <laughs> And this is another series that I call Shimmer. And it's images from the south of France, from mainly from um, Cannes and the area around Cannes. And it's a very, again, a very loose collection of images. And the idea behind it was really that it's this beautiful, sparkling, glamorous light on everything, you know, on jewels, on the sea, on everything. But underneath there's a kind of gritty, grittiness and a sort of very cutthroat sort of, materialistic in a sort of quite nasty way, really. Uh, so it's just that little glimmer of that side. And I often played with the, with the sea to be the underside, the dark side, and then the light on the surface. So 
So these cut-up figures they have all over can. Um, this was my favorite one ever. Um, and they removed it and they put some really ugly sort of Disney thing in its place. So I was quite sad. <laughs> And this, this is actually Bella Hadid's legs on the red carpet during the Cannes Film Festival. So, so that's, that's the little book. And with these books, I did uh, this sort of, I played around and tried to get it to look right. Um, and I printed the pictures on fine art paper, but they ended up to being too white, too sort of stark looking. So I started washing them in various things, coffee and tea and watercolors and all sorts of things. So I got this really sort of kind of dirty look, which I quite like. <laughs> That's, uh, that's uh, just, you can just see the tower of the Carlton Hotel there behind her. Yeah, so that's the end of that. In the en end of the book, I, I just wrote one sentence. I said, um, the way the light shimmers on the surface and the dark flip side of it all. So there's no text apart from that line. Now, this is another series. This is a very personal series about um, a really, really terrible year, which was last year, where I lost two members of my family. Um, and they were in the UK. And I was at that time stuck here, couldn't get back to the UK, stuck in Switzerland. Um, so I kind of wandered around um, taking pictures of trees and things, just because there were no people around. And, you know, it just became a sort of therapy, really. Um, so I called this um, falling to pieces. So there, there is a sort of um, motif throughout the book um, of trees, trees and then other things. The, the other thing I photographed were lots of um, small family moments, just quiet things with, my, you know, with my, my children and my husband, like my son and his beautiful socks and flip-flops, or it's a good combo. <laughs> my two fighting cats. And then the, I'm sure everybody did the, the lockdown haircuts. That was one of the early ones. And this unfortunate <laughs> gruesome discovery was in my, we decided to clean up uh, my son's room and found he'd kept his wisdom teeth. <laughs> and then the, the trees again. These are, um, this was a Polaroid that I, uh, I, I cropped the white out so it fit with everything. And then I, I, during this time, I, because I live in the center of the city, I'd never realized how badly I needed nature. And I was constantly drawn back to nature, whether it's little pockets within the city, you know, or, or the, the lakeside. Those are my parents. My father was one of the family members who died. And this is the little book I made. So that on the cover, the first page, it says, the world is falling to pieces and all I photograph is rocks and trees. And that comes from um, something that, uh, um, Henri Cartier-Bresson said about, um, um, about uh, going blank, um, the American landscape photographer, An Ansel Adams and Watson. This, and this is the text. 
there, I didn't make very many of this book. I think there were only 11. Like they were quite, it was quite a laborious process, but a lot of people found the text uh, quite, quite difficult. It was quite honest. And... So here it says, um, the book is dedicated to my father and to my brother-in-law who died uh, in 2020. And that's it. That's uh, those are the pictures I have. Wonderful, so Alison. Shall I stop sharing now, or yeah. shall I stay? Yes, stop sharing. So sorry to hear about your dad and your. Thank you. Law. Thank you. Sounds like a an even worse year for you. Yeah. So it was a bad year for everyone, but it was very bad for us. Yeah. So I just, I just love your work. It's, Thank you very much. It has this real dreamlike quality. And I always, I'm always in awe about how you actually manage to um, create those images. Um, do, you, do you shoot primarily with film or digital? No, I haven't for a long time. I mean, I really, really love the look of film. Um, yeah. But I'm sort of super environmentally friendly, or at least I try and be. So, yeah. um, and I'm also very impatient. So digital does quite suit me. <laughs> but I found all sorts of tricks that um, give um, digital yeah. more texture. I, I use yeah. lenses, and I, I've actually even made my own lenses and things like that that I uh, clamp on. Not lenses, filters rather that I clamp yeah. onto the lens and things like that. Yeah, I did. I did try making lenses, but it was a bit of a disaster. <laughs> it didn't actually work. <laughs> Yeah, that's what I was wondering if it was different um, filters that you played around with. It's just yes, quite quite often, yeah. Yeah. And Alison, do you um, print your own um, pages of the books? Yes, I do. Yeah, I have a Canon um, Pixma printer, the Pro. Yeah. It's right next to me, Pro Ten S, um, and it, uh, yeah, it's really good. It prints really well. Um, yeah, the quality is really good. I mean, my books are quite small, but it can print up to A3. So, but my mine are usually quite. Actually, I got some here. You know, this is really tiny. So you can see oh, this nice. is the falling to pieces, mm -hmm. and <clears throat> this is the dan dancing with the cobra. So. And I, I have fun. I play around with them and add little things like this is a Chinese coin. And yeah. I, I love it. I'm kind of slightly obsessed with the bookmaking side of it. A bit too much. I've had to slow myself <laughs> down. So I get back to taking pictures and don't make too many books. It's not a bad thing to be obsessed. No. And very good for lockdown too, I must say, because the streets around here where I'm trapped are just so boring right now. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I just like you. I just love Asia and it just is it's a place that gets right under your skin yeah exactly yeah. I agree and mm -hmm. lovely people too so gentle and nice yeah thanks Alison we might move Thank on you. we're running out yes. of time um so Julia you're up next would yes. you like to, Thank you. would you like to start yeah I will share my screen. So let's see. Um, let's see. So I start the first. So can you see the image or is it yes. cut on the edge? Is it cut on the edge or it's, is it perfect no, it's fitting? Fine. No, we can see it all. Okay. So hello, everybody. And thank you for inviting us and me. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really happy to be part of this session. So um, yeah, I want to jump uh, directly into my street photography. So because um, uh, I started taking pictures when I was 20, more or less. And then uh, I moved to Bremen, to another city for uh, studying psychology first. Um, and in the beginning, uh, at that time, I, I, I was taking a lot of pictures of my boyfriend and of friends. So in the beginning, you're always very shy when you start um, photographing, I think. So this image for me remarks uh, my watershed to uh, that I felt I have to go out in the streets. And that's really one day in, uh, it was in 98 when I lived in Bremen at that time. I was studying photography at that time already. But then I, I said, okay, let's go out. So I went here to the um, station 
And for me, this image also shows already uh, my search for, because um, I always, I'm always, I always have been between narrative images and uh, abstract formal um, solutions. So here you can um, see that I sometimes combine uh, in one that I try to, to, to tell a story, but it's all, also it's, I try to go to the ed edges of the image and to, to make this kind of uh, compositions. So you will see in my series uh, that it, I'm always in between. The, some images are more narrative. So here also it was at, at that time that I really went out. I was in a, in a photo group already in Bremen uh, for street photography. And we were discussing about all photographers and Cathy Bresson and we were really uh, talking a lot, a lot about photography. So this is more narrative and here you see more the other side of my uh, solution image um, that I, I always, I don't know, some, somehow in my head, maybe I need some structure. I try to structure the world by looking for forms, abstraction, or uh, so this image for me, I love if images have um, another layer. So this is for me like a question mark, or you can think about, it's opening up some things. Um, where are we heading to where the people are going, we are going with our uh, mankind, whatever. So this was just a waiting cue, but uh, I like, for me, images are good when you, when you also find the sec uh, different levels or layers. So I, I now jump directly in my uh, diploma work. It's uh, maybe you know me uh, for my, because I have obviously a passion for swimming <laughs> and um, so this is about the public bath. That was my diploma work. Um, so I, I told you that I was studying photography in the University of Arts, uh, Academy of Arts in Bremen. And I was struggling at that time uh, for the theme of the diploma work because people, at that time it was very popular to go out and to make travel stories and to go to Siberia or whatever. But I felt, no, I'm better working right, right beside me. So. Um, then I try to focus on what I really love. And then if you, if you follow what you love, maybe you're taking also the best pictures of. So I, I um, organized uh, entrances to swimming pools in Bremen and Hamburg and wherever I went, I tried to go into the pools. And so um, here are just a few images of this, um, of this work. And it was really, uh, you have to imagine, I was also in a swimming suit. So I, I tried to be on the same level like the people. And maybe Julia, you know that how it is. Um, you have to, go to, to really go because you're for, um, photographing people naked and also bathing. Um, you have to go on the same level with them. So um, you have to, to imagine myself in a swimming suit. And I spent hours in the swimming pool. So really it's just observing to see how people feel comfortable. And sometimes nothing is happening. And sometimes I just go for, for a swim, but that's why I love these places. They are um, kind of private place You're in between privacy and public. public. So um, I love this, uh, this contradiction of this place like pools. Uh, so, and everybody goes. So in Germany, it's quite um, deep related to our culture. We learn swimming in school. We go swimming with my grandma and whatever. So it's a quite, um, a quite uh, public and um, normal place. So this image I like because sometimes it's better like in a good literature not to tell everything and to, to tell less. Uh, so here not to show the water and the pool makes the image more open or more like a metaphor for, uh, of course you know what it is, but um, the framing and to the decision not to show the pool side makes it less documentary, more like abstract. And of course, for me, photography is a kind of tool to, because I'm quite communicative, I love to go to other people. I am not too shy in communicating. And for me, it's also a tool to, to come, to bring myself in relation to, to the world. So, and um, my camera helps me to always open up to others. So here also, I, I, I swam to this lady or I swam like this. <laughs> and then we were talking and then I, I took this image. So it end, and it was ending up in a book, like a small book, because it was in a, I was invited. I, I won a big award with this, uh, this um, series because I think it was quite unusual in that time, this small format black and white imagery, not from Siberia, whatever. 
So, um, and then I had an exhibition and uh, so on and so on. And yeah, my love for water and uh, swimming pools and bathing cultures continued. So I applied for a, a residency in Japan, like Mac. Um, and uh, I found there is a small bathing house called Sento. Um, and uh, bathing is very related to, um, uh, it's, it's, it's very deeply related in the Japanese culture. culture. It's because you, if you wash yourself, it's a kind of, you wash your, it's a spiritual thing. So these places for me were very um, intimate and very um, precious places out of the busy Japanese society. So I, I um, with the help of people from Japan, I, I entered in these um, places which are really cozy and, uh, and hot. They have a lot of hot springs. So, and the bathing houses, this, they are from that time where people didn't have a bath uh, at home. So people went to the neighborhood and just went, uh, for washing. And, and now it's still, even if they have swimming pool, um, bathing uh, um, at home, uh, they still go there for uh, like a neighborhood uh, communication stuff. So, and then, yeah, that's really one thing wherever I go and I was traveling a lot because I work as a photographer, I was traveling a lot around the world. So everywhere I go, I try to see what are the bathing cultures there. And uh, it's still my, it, I'm still going on. And um, so this image, I, for me, it's one, important image of myself because it shows um, this is made in Slovakia, but it doesn't matter. It could be everywhere. Um, it shows for me the strength of photography to really to hold the time and to press a button and then you feel the time and the still stand. And that's for me one image where I love it because you feel that half a, a second later, the image will destroy it, be destroyed by itself. So, and also that you have this, um, um, that the, the figure itself, it's not so important. It's the shadow, which is, which is important for the story. And so you have this kind of up, uh, upside down, the inversion of, um, of uh, things. And yeah, it's some, for me, it's kind of philosophical also. Here you can see the, the, the spread also. And it's, yeah, it's also, it was made a book. I had a very nice, um, editing house and this was also the center book um, here in Berlin, the pepperoni books. I don't know if you know this nice uh, editing house that unfortunately the publisher died uh, two years ago. So, but you see, I, I love, uh, this is in Hungary, in Germany, in whatever. So ever I go, I try to collect um, images. And here also you see that images from last year yeah, and maybe I don't have to say too much about this image. So I, then I, I, I thought maybe I show you some, also some newer work um, because uh, of course now the um, pandemic also is changing our lives. Uh, and um, I started, I was always dreaming a lot uh, since, I, since I, I can remember, but um, so I want to share some, some parts of the, this new work because I was dreaming a lot intensively in the beginning of the first lockdown and even now. And always I'm, I'm waking up very uh, lucky when I, I have dreams in my head and I now I, I also, um, uh, and because the imagery you get from, from dreams are so crazy and so uh, lovely. So I tried to go into my archive and find some uh, pictures which are related maybe to the to the uh, story I was dreaming and that was a kind of a game which started for me to look for images which connect to my um, to my real dream dreams um, without showing the same stuff so maybe I read the text and you look on, on the image and you say if it works for you or not so I'm dreaming my head off tonight in my dream I was present at the birth of a calf which for a short time was a cult. Interestingly, it didn't come out of the cow, but it disappeared inside her. In the end, it lay exhausted on the ground and was licked by a horse. How changeable things are in dreams. Why do I always dream of my original family? 
Not a night goes by without one of the members of my large family, from young to old, appearing. Today I dreamt of Grandpa Walter. We visited him in his home. He was laying in bed with his computer and chatting diligently. I had to smile because he was about 100 years old. I dreamt about a psychopath tonight and he was my boyfriend of all people. He looked astonishingly similar like Joker. I was in the deepest inner distress because I didn't know how to get rid of him for the best. It was simply terrible because I was afraid he would kill me. After all, I was at least making escape plans. In this dream, I was somewhere doing yoga. The lineup was in a row. I stayed at the very back in the last row and hoped that no one would notice that I was actually naked. I was not completely relaxed, completely relaxed. After all, I lined up, I could have skipped the class. So, and I want to finish uh, with another work where, where for, um, for me, I was writing a text too. So I'm, for the moment, I'm pretty much into writing texts also, or to make combinations, uh, com combinations between images and text. So um, I want to show you this work. Um, I got, it, I, it started in March that I also got um, a Leica, like a monochrome camera from Leica. They landed me, uh, they gave it to me to test. And I, had, I was planning to take pictures in, in Rome on the street photography festival there about street photographers. But then the lockdown came and I had the camera and I said, okay, so I have to switch, I have to do something else. So I started this series and um, I also, I will read the text uh, beside it. Blanket over Berlin. Everything is slowed down, frozen, unsettled. Only the light is as clear and angular as, as ever at this time of year. Tender spring fever collides with the standstill of things. It's hard for me to pause. I'm still allowed to take a walk, so I set out and look at my city. I recognize many things, but some things are strangely different. On the radio, I hear the term interspace competence, which is what we need now. Dealing with the in-between. Resilience, that could be become the word of the year. We are in a state of suspense. The longer I roam through this reduced city, the more I enjoy the silence, the friendly nodding neighbors at the windows, the loud chirping of the birds, the space on the pavements, the people with time. Yet the musings, the feeling of being cut off from the rest of the world and the daily updated numbers are also, also there. My father belongs to the risk group. I'm worried. When can I visit my parents again? What do you think distance and mistrust will do to us? In what directions are we steering? There's a blanket over Berlin and maybe over the world, but, uh, but fortunately it hasn't fallen on my head yet. I try to keep it upright and let go, drifting in this unusual floating state. Okay, so that was my part. And um, if you want to go deeper in the projects, I've just uh, relaunched my website last week. So uh, feel free to, to go deeper in and, uh, and maybe explore also more work. So, okay. Wonderful. Thank you, Julia. That um, I, yeah. I love that the real dreams um, book. I mean, we can all totally relate to that because I think all of us were having amazing dreams, especially at the beginning of the pandemic. And just oh, yeah, yeah. the little stories that, <laughs> that go with, it. especially the it's, younger one. <laughs> yeah, it really. I wake up and uh, when I remember, um, I, 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 it's like a gift that you get it from your inner side and you feel that you they are related to the real world but also and also now I'm the COVID is all completely inside so I, I I'm dreaming the mask and then I feel in the train oh, we are maybe too close together so you can feel that the outer world is coming inside now after one year 
yeah it's really um interesting yeah and it's it's i like the imagery it's really a uh, very uh, it's very fantasyful uh i think yeah yeah, yeah. so um you will have to definitely come to australia and um discover our pools our of course I, I i have it on my list yeah. i've never been to australia <laughs> but i have it on my list definitely Okay. Well, you'll have lots of friends here you can travel travel to. He'll show you the coast. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. I, I would love to because Julia, I was um, I was featuring your work also in Instagram last year for yes, my big splash. So because uh, well, yeah, I feel really it's a special light, and it, I, I I felt that I have to go there also to yeah. for my series. And, yeah. And Julia, I have to also tell you that I also have a grandfather, Walter. Oh, uh, really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cool that's pretty funny <laughs> so, so same names julia and walter yeah that's funny um okay julia, there was, oh sorry there was a, a few questions for julia actually um yeah. and they're, they're sort of related but the first one um was from meg actually um how did you manage to get into the bathhouses in japan i'm presuming um how did you agree uh how did you get to be able to get inside or, and was it hard to get that access yeah so uh as i told you that um i i was invited in japan for a, a scholarship and i had an exhibition there and uh, there was one gallerist um he he was exhibiting my the public bus work in japan so he said you have to come to japan so i came i could stay in in the gallery and he had a little room there and with his help I knew other people, also women, and there was especially one living next to the gallery. She was very helpful to go with me to the to the centers. And then she was introducing me. We were talking to the people because I cannot speak any word in Japanese. I never tried it even. Um, so it was really delicate. I had my small Leica uh, with film. And sometimes I just took three images. So I really... the. Um, I was very it was very delicate, but it was very um, uh, yeah. With the help of others, I could go in and I could take pictures there. And at, at the end, um, I also there was one man said, "Ah, oh, you can come with me to the man side." And so, uh, so it was more like a, a process that I I got known in Nara. It was mostly taken in Nara, mm -hmm. uh, but also then later in Tokyo. Mm. And of course, now this work uh, would not be able to, to be done anymore because it was in 2007. And now I, I went to Japan two years ago and now in all centers you have the mobile phones, um, the sign yeah. that it's not allowed to for taking pictures and to take uh, you, you and to, to, to phone. So um, I think that also, also um, I'm very happy that I did I have a lot of work now done on the whole bathing series around the world because it's getting more and more difficult to enter in these spaces and to take pictures with the people. Yeah, but yeah. I'm happy. I want to do a, a, a big book in the end out of it. I still because I have so much of the, the whole um, on the world. So uh, I'm happy that I the work is almost done because it could have been too difficult now or too annoying to to get the permissions and so. And yeah. Did you go, uh, Mac? Did you ever have? Have you ever been in a sento, or or an onsen? Oh, you have to unmute yourself. Oh, here we go. Uh, thanks, thanks for that explanation. Um, yeah, I've been to many uh, sentos and and um, and I would love to make pictures inside, but I'm I'm always um, I've asked, but I've never been given permission. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but there are lovely people places. Are, people are a lot more aware of cameras now, and and That's maybe it. That's going it. in with a proper camera then was different. But um, but now they're just no to all photos. Yeah. 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 Um, Julia, following on from that, someone also asked um, on the legal aspect of your Baden Stolt shots. I'm presuming they're the ones from Bremen. Baden Stolt. Baden Stolt shots like the shot of the man coming through the curtains and so, and, um, so wondering what kind of, um, I guess, access did you have to get? Is there any privacy issues the person is asking? 
so also this series is maybe it's now quite a long time ago so i had um i was i was asking permissions from the the press re, uh, republic of this of the pool so they there was a woman she she uh, supported my work she she gave me access so then i that's the first level to, to that you have the uh, the permission mm. then you go in and then you are talking to the people and then you are um just dealing with them and then you feel because then when you stay a while everybody's knowing you and then you maybe write down the email addresses and then you send the pictures and so and it's really a question of trust and of uh, of communication so i uh, i'm also using 50 millimeter lens or 35 so i i'm and also i'm part of the scenery i'm not hiding i'm uh, in the water people see me and um of course i got the the official permission to be there and um that's how it works. Yeah. So people actually know what you're doing, and then yeah, I'm explaining. I, I was explaining. I'm I'm a student for photography, and and people are quite curious. And if you, it's a question. You know, it's it, like in all street photography. It's a question of how you deal with the people, how open you are, and you, if you get give back something, uh, then people sometimes also like it to be photographed and be part of a project. So I was. I went to Iceland. I had a scholarship there because, of course, I had to go to Iceland one day for the uh, hot springs. And also people there, they really were quite open and felt like honored to be part of the project. Uh, so that also can happen. It's just a question of uh, how you communicate it. Yeah. 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 Yeah, exactly. And a common theme, I think, too, which has come up many times in these sorts of talks is the advantage we have as women, I think, in these situations, yeah, true. we're definitely mm. not nowhere near as of you know, That's true. we pick up on people's emotions and you know all that sort yeah, of yeah, yeah, yeah. But how you do it, uh, Julia, on the, on the coast, and uh, you, you're working the same probably that you are there, people know you, and then you talk to the people. How do you manage? Um, most mostly, I don't talk talk with people because. Um, my my photos are candid so I don't I don't want to sort of interact with people okay. but because I'm down there all the time most of the um local people know know me and know what I'm doing and they're familiar with my photography so and the other thing is a lot of my my photos are kind of a little bit abstract in a way it's similar to yours you know photographing kind of on the edges it's like that that crossover um so they're not like they're not really explicit in in your face um like you know some people's work is um so yeah but i i like for example this afternoon down there i was taking photos and I was just mostly taking photos of reflections. And so if people ask me what I'm doing, um, I just show them. I'm just quite open with them about what I'm doing. So, mm -hmm. but it, it is really an advantage being a woman in those sort of situations, definitely. True. Yeah. Okay, well, thanks. Thanks all for your um, the presentations. We um, have a little bit of time now to ask. There are just a couple of questions that Rebecca and I have. Um, Beck, do you want to ask some of the questions if there are no other questions from um, the audience? It doesn't seem like there's any other audience questions. So please, um, please type your questions in if you have them so that we can ask, ask questions had some great presentations. So um, I'm sure that there are lots of questions you have to ask people. So don't be shy. Don't hold back. No, <laughs> Just, now's your opportunity. Yeah, now's your opportunity. <laughs> so. I'm um, quite interested to know about how your experience of in being in up photographers, like being part of a collective, um, is for you and um, I guess the benefit of, of being in the group for you and your projects and your photography. Whoever maybe wants to answer it, first. Yeah, maybe I was talking a lot, so maybe Meg or Alison. Okay, should I uh, start? Um, yeah, I think it's a, it's a really great group and we're kind of, we're all very mature. There's not, no, no fighting anymore and things like that. 
Um, and I, what I really appreciate is our little, little group within the group, which is the women of ARP. Um, and we get a lot out of that. I mean, we, we, uh, we have ways of communicating with just us and we do projects together, but then it's really nice to be part of the bigger, the larger group as well. Um, yeah, and, and we're there for each other if we want advice on anything. Uh, you know, we share little bits of bits and pieces of things that we've seen. So yeah, I feel like it's a very supportive group and that we all like each other, which is, a, you know, it's just a really nice thing. Yeah. And so do you do specific projects as a, as a group, um, the group of women yourself, or do you also sort of participate in the broader um, projects that the collective do? I we mean, do both. We, um, would someone else like to take this on? But we do both. Yeah, I can answer that. Um, <laughs> so the um, there, there's a bit of both. Where there's talk of various um, group projects, and obviously the whole group discusses social media and Instagram takeovers and different themes for um, for that. But then the women of up, the glorious women of up, the ladies of up, the glup, <laughs> we call them the glorious ladies of up. Um, yeah. We, we have our own um, projects as well, such as the portfolio reviews that we did um, last year. We did a call out uh, for people to submit work and, and all the, the GLUPs uh, gave up their time to meet with those um, people and offer them advice um, with their portfolios, which was a lot of fun and it was a great yeah. project to do. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds so like a lot of the people that I, that I've um, spoken with about those portfolio reviews certainly got a lot out of them. So it's nice to yeah. hear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we originally we wanted to meet all together in, uh, sorry, we wanted to meet all together in, the, in Italy last year in Rome. This is a little yes. bit really, uh, because we, the women are mostly, the women are quite uh, new to the group. Yeah. So I would have loved to see people in, in person. And this mm -hmm. year, we, I think that should happen soon when the pandemic yeah. is yes. better. Because that's also it's all the zooms cannot um, really or it, yeah it's 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 good but it's, uh, it's the same. It would be lovely to yeah. meet us all in in person. Yeah, I think we're all getting a bit zoomed out, right? Yes, <laughs> true. <laughs> yeah, to travel um, again. I can't wait to travel again. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Meg, I bet you miss Japan so much. For me, it was also very important to be to become part of the apps uh, to open up my horizons, yeah, my photographic because, um, yeah, with apps, I get much more uh, inspiration from outside of Europe, also. So, that for me, it's yeah. a new, new thing. Uh, because I must say, in Germany, the street photography is not very vivid, so it's not a, a big scene. Probably it's different than in, in Australia or in the US, but here. With all the legal stuff, people, it's not really a big thing. So, yeah. Yeah. I'm for me, what it was really enlarging my um, my input, what I get, and that I really, it's very precious. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the same here. Switzerland uh, street photography is almost non-existent now. Um, so yeah, it's really nice to belong to something in the wider world. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. And for me, being in Australia and so far away from the rest of the world, it's it's really great to <laughs> feel connected to the rest of the world, even with all the different time zones for the Zooms and everything. It's it's um great to know that we're all somehow joined. Mm. Yeah. yeah, that's been one good yeah. thing about this. Yeah. Uh, we, we've Georgia and I um, and Debrani Das were involved in starting up a women's photography group in South Asia, and now all you want to do is get over there and meet these women and go shooting with them and, you know, hang out with them. Yeah. I just, just can't wait to get back to India. Mm. <laughs> we have got some more questions. Yeah. Um, one, someone's asking, will you repeat the portfolio reviews? I think a few people were a bit disappointed that they didn't put their hand up at the time, me included. <laughs> Perhaps, yeah. Maybe we haven't discussed it yet, but uh, I think it's a nice thing to do, and we all yeah. enjoyed it, and we got a lot out of it. So, I think probably yes, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think it could become an annual thing. Yeah. Mm. Sure. Like there's nice. some interest there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Someone has asked, 
Um, to all of you, the three of you, how did you initially start getting your work out there? Did you approach certain people or just start sharing your work on public platforms like Instagram? For me, I just started sharing my work. <laughs> yeah. I, I was website, social media. Yeah. Yeah, I was kind of working quietly on my own for years and years. And then suddenly I found fl Flickr in 2011, I think. And then I realized that there were <laughs> other weirdos like me out there. And, <laughs> and it was a, a great feeling. Yeah. I think yeah. for me, well, the, 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 the starting point was before the social media became... Um, became relevant because it doesn't exist. I was starting in 95, um, my studies. So at that time there wasn't any internet. So I was, I had this, I told you about the group, the photographers group, and we did exhibition, exhibitions a lot. And I started to work as a photographer uh, for press uh, in 98. So I'm working as a full-time photographer for more than 20 years now. So I work for, yeah magazines and newspapers and I did a lot of exhibitions and of course now social media became a um, big part of um, my of this work yeah yeah but I, I'd say I would also recommend that it's not right for everybody but uh, I do think studying a lot of people say oh you don't need that you don't need that but I think it adds a lot and yeah. I don't think I would be able to have developed and have had the sturdy platform that I feel that I have if I hadn't studied formally. I mean, you can always, I think you learn through all of that and you discover more about yourself and then you can sort of be free and do whatever you want. I think it's actually a liberating thing even though you might feel constrained while you're studying, but uh, never ignore that, that what it could do because it can be a great thing. It's not for everyone, but it's, for me, it was so important. For me also, I think it's very, for me it was, I would not, would not be here now at the point when I didn't enter the art school. I had not the, the self-insurance that I, I'm a really good photographer. So because I was studying psychology first and then I, I had this wish, ah, photography is, is interesting, but I never, I could have done a portfolio and go out and say hello, with, no. you don't have to study for be, being a photographer, but this was a very precious time to, to, to learn, to read images, to talk about your images, mm -hmm. to think about what you want, and then to have this experimental field yes. and before going out. So that was also my experience that it was mm -hmm. quite, I can't to, just encourage yeah. if you, uh, to have this time for yourself to develop your handwriting and your- Yes, uh, and to understand more about your yeah. place within the whole wider scene as well. Mm, it's, uh, true. It's a, almost a shortcut, really. It sounds like a lot of work, but it is a shortcut to greater sort of understanding, I think. Yeah, yeah but you see in Mac, in Mac, Mac, Mac you did uh, um, painting first, right? Yeah, also, I, I studying also. Yeah. 1990 to 94, yeah. Really. Same time like me, no. uh, earlier yeah. than me. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> but would you, say, would you say also that this is also, was important for you to develop this? Oh, kind of absolutely, kind of every, like, a lot of my best friends are all still people that I met at art school. Yeah. And, um, you know, like I surround myself with creative people and that's kind of part of who I am. So it all kind of comes from that time. Yeah. yeah. Um, I was the only one that ended up pursuing photography. And ironically, at art school, I, I didn't even like photography. <laughs> so <laughs> I found it really annoying because at the time we had to write we had to go and shoot a roll of film and write down the aperture and the shutter speed and, oh. and just get caught up <laughs> in the moment. Oh, and I'd be like, oh people. my God, I haven't written anything down. I'm going to get in trouble, you know. <laughs> it was just too rigid for me. Um, but then when I could do it on my own terms, I, I wanted to learn all those technical things about it and, and how, um, how to make a great photo and how to control the equipment. Um, and then once you've learned all those things, then you can put them aside and just focus on what you think or feel, you know, um, like you say, Alison, it's, um, you know, you kind of learn it and throw it away. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> but I also think in terms of, uh, connecting with people and meeting people, cause part of the question was, how did you initially start to get your work out there? Um, I know for people in Australia, we feel like we're a long way away from the rest of the world. Uh, cause we are on an Island 
you know we are a long way away (laughs) we are a long way away (laughs) and even rebecca's a long way away over in perth you know it would take me five or six days to drive there to see her um (laughs) so that's just the the scale that we're dealing with here but um you know festivals are great so if you you know the festivals we have in australia people come together and they talk and um you realize there's a community there but if you can, you know, and when we can travel in the future again, hopefully, um, you know, getting to the big festivals overseas, you really feel like you can connect with people and um, and make and make those sort of contacts that will um, get your work out there in the future. Yeah, as well. that's that's important to do if if you can if you can do it if you're able to do it. That's yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, guys, we might wrap it up because people are starting to drop off. Um, So any more questions before we go? Any more last minute questions? Do you have, um, Alison or Julia or Meg, do you have any questions for us at all? No, but I want to thank you for the opportunity. It's been great. Yeah, thank you very much. Well, we're, we're very... Um, grateful to the to the glops yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. grateful for back both, both sessions it's just been brilliant and and it's been really interesting because the just between the two sessions so the first session with with Eleanor Graciela and Melissa their work is all is quite different to to your um, to the work of, of you three so it was really interesting to see you know the variation between all your work is just amazing mm. and you're all s- such talented artists so it's brilliant to um to see the projects that you're working on so thank you very and, much thank and you lots of people here have said you know thanks very much to to you all for for doing this for us so really thank you very much you, thank you and I'm happy to see you again meg yeah, yeah, you too. <laughs> See you soon, post COVID. Hey. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, so thanks everyone for joining us. And thank uh, you. Yeah. Goodbye. Okay. Bye. Thank you for everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.